We're here in Zurich, Switzerland to talk to a man who's a retailer, a museum curator, and a watchmaker. He's also a watch collector. His name is Rene Bayer, and today we're talking watches. Well, thank you, Rene, so much for joining us. It's really a pleasure to sit here in your beautiful museum and to, to chat with you. You know, for me, it's also not the daily experience I have today, <laughs> so I look forward to that interview and welcome to everybody. Great. If we can start, can you tell us a little bit about where we are right now, about this museum and your, your store upstairs? Well, in reality, I could tell you we are underneath Bahnhofstrasse here in Zurich, and this is home almost for 50 years now for this museum. And just above us is your store as well. Yeah, we should not forget to mention that. It's <laughs> the oldest business as far as I know. We always said Switzerland, but when we realized we are older than the United States as a country, we were slowly, modestly starting to say, well, we consider even probably we are the oldest known watch and jewelry business in the world, especially still being in family possession. And you're what generation? Well, I guess I do not look like 258 <laughs> years old, but I'm eight generations. So in general, make about 35 years on okay. the business actively. So you, you've really grown up in watches. You've been around watches your whole life. But, but we have here your first watch, a Rolex Datejust Oyster Quartz. Yes, with the integrated bracelet, with the Oyster bracelet. It's a very nice watch. It even bears my initials on the back. And I got that at the age of 16, so just one year after I left uh, Zurich to go to the French part of Switzerland. And this has followed me through all my journeys at the school of Neuchâtel and of La Chaux-de-Fonds. And I only gave it up afterwards around the age of 22 or 23 when I got interested in other watches. And we have another day chest here as mm -hmm. well. What's the story behind that day chest? Well, this is typical for the 90s to have a watch that was not stainless steel, but also not all gold. I like to be in a way modest. This was probably my most uh, uh, bling bling watch I have. Okay. I rather prefer, even if it's not always stainless steel, having colors such as gray or silver, like it is the case with platinum or with stainless steel or titanium. And continuing mm -hmm. with Rolex, we, we have a pair of day dates here yeah. that are in some ways very similar and in some ways very different. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely right. This is the watch my father was wearing as his white gold watch. And uh, when he died, he passed away, unfortunately, in 2002. We had kind of a split up of his personal watches within the family. And I was uh, immediately saying, well, this I would love to have. It was the same watch that also Andre Heinecke, a very close friend of my father, they were together in the military. It's like army seals or people that are in the army. You have a relationship everywhere in the world, which is uncomparable when you have been sleeping with the cows in a farmhouse and afterwards you go back to a company like Rolex or Bayer. They kept a relationship, a friend, all through 40 years until the death of uh, wow. Mr. Andre Heinecke. So wow. this is also a watch that Mr. Andre Heinecke was wearing the same model, probably had many more oh, watches, right. but in all the catalogs, it was always this presidential Rolex day date, uh, which of course is something special. Everywhere when I was in America, this was the watch that everybody wanted to have. That was before the Daytona uh, <laughs> was coming on the market. And the other one that is a very, very special piece to me, for our 250th anniversary, Rolex was asking us what we would love to have. And it was just a year where they started to make these beautiful dials mm. for the platinum watches, ice blue dial. And it has from Rolex also an engraving. You can perhaps read it's 250 years with our logo. I wear it for a very special occasion, especially when I have the chance to go to Rolex. And so, so far, we've mostly been dealing with watches from your personal collection, mm -hmm. but we also have quite a few pieces from the museum collection, which is in, in some ways your family's collection. So thinking about your, your relationship with Rolex, we then have this watch, which is an extremely special watch. Absolutely, because this is the watch that has been given to my grandfather by Mr. Hans Wilsdorf. It's also engraved on the backside, and it is also as a piece already there 
it was the famous day day watch so we are very happy to have also these pieces in our collection ending with the piece that was on the Batis cap of August Picard 10,916 meters below the water surface and on the other side you have the beautiful watch which is so called we don't know if it was Sherpa Tenzing or Edmund Hillary wearing it on the top of Mount Everest in the 1953 expedition yeah. to that still incredible mountain. And what makes it very special, you can put it even over your suit, you will see the bracelet is still the oh, regional yeah. one because it was impossible to think that they would have been able to open uh. their wrists like that. So they had to wear it like the pilots during World War II over their combination because at minus 40 degrees yeah, Celsius, not you up. are not <laughs> want to open up the <laughs> wrist. So it's very special and it has the original tag from Edmund Hillary when he sent it from New Zealand. And uh, this is what makes us very happy that this watch is now in a place where everybody can see it. That's like I still dream of having a watch that was on the moon. Everything that has been at the place that seems so unreal is something we need to have in the museum. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, that's, that's what this watch did as well, right? Okay, of course, this was not the one that was on the Baptist cap, otherwise they would not have made it stainless steel gold. I was told that Rolex offered to very special partners the version in stainless steel gold, which is, of course, understandable. It was exactly produced the same way. Yeah. Have you ever tried to wear this watch? Uh, honestly, no. I, now that you say it, I'm tempted to try it you out. You should try but, it. Yeah, okay. Why don't we try it if you have a second? Oh, wow. I have to eat more. <laughs> this would be the first doctor saying, you need to eat more in order to wear this watch. It's so big. I never had this on my wrist. You make me learn today wow. things I did not know. Of, but it really looks... <laughs> <laughs> like it's a uh, little different. the cake on the wrist. <laughs> right. <laughs> Another brand that your family has a close relationship with is, is Patek Philippe. And we see here on, on kind of both trays, your, your sort of personal watches and the museum watches, watches that, that represent that. We have three Patek Philippe's here, all of which are, are very special and unique to, to Bayer. Can yep. you talk us through the, the three pieces? Okay. One is a piece that was made not that many years ago. It was the pre-series of the new chronograph that Patek has developed with that beautiful movement. I think it was the reference 5170. But for Bayer, they decided to make the first 50 pieces with the tachymeter instead of the telemeter scale. So this is a very special piece because Patek was making it for our 250th anniversary for our clients. How many of them were made? 50 pieces. 50 pieces. Now there is another piece. You have perhaps heard that we are the first Swiss retailer having a Patek Philippe boutique. Yes. I feel always when I speak about Patek, it's such a special relationship. Mm. So they also decided for the fifth anniversary of that boutique which was in 2016, to make a special edition. So Patek and us, we allow ourselves to make commemorative pieces for the good of both companies. And we can always help special collectors to get things in their collection, which are even more special than what is already special mm. that Patek produces. Here, this is a 3450. This is for me a very special piece because Back in 1983, when I started to sell watches in our company, this was my first watch I sold. I first sold a Swatch watch on the same day. And then in the afternoon, my uncle and my aunt came and I suggested them as an investment to buy this watch. And today I will never sell this piece anymore. This is also a part now indirectly of the museum, but it's still in my private possession as long as I live. But this is so special also because it is signed with Bayer. And whenever you have a piece that you find, go for it. It is worth about 10, 15%, definitely more than a piece without a retailer sure. signature. And we see that special Bayer signature carry through to, to a pair of pieces mm -hmm. over here, a 2499 and then a 3940 as well. And I know we were talking a little bit before, this 3940 has a really amazing story behind it as well. Yeah. 
It's also the story of recognition of Philip Stern, the relationship he had with my father, Teddy Bayer. They were really very close friends. This product was actually the follower of this perpetual calendar. And this was bearing that famous movement 240 automatic with decentralized micro rotor. And this is for me still like an iconic watch. I think if I could choose the watch of the last century, which is the most beautiful one, it's 24.99. But this is really the watch that my father was always loving. And it was an honor for us to have the first 25 pieces that Patek ever produced of caliber 240. In this particular case, for us as a pre-series of the 225th anniversary of our company, for the collectors, it's important to know 15 of them were made in German language and 10 pieces in English. Okay, and then this one's even more special. When you turn it over, uh, it says number one and has a special engraving. That's right. Number one, it says also on the dial, okay. which is very unusual because Patek only puts the number for the tourbillons on the, mm. on the dial. You mentioned Patek Philippe tourbillon. I have never seen one of these before. This is a, a massive, rectangular yellow gold mm -hmm. Patek Turbion with a, a really interesting history. Can you tell us about the history of this piece? Yeah, I could, but I want to know what would you like to offer me for that piece? <laughs> you seem to be in love with it. <laughs> I think it might be a little big for me, but oh, uh, you know, I think I would wear this. Yeah, I yeah. think with the blue coat, it would be it's, it just fits. perfect, right? In the same year that we celebrated 225th anniversary, my father was saying, you know, I always loved the piece which Patek was having. And Philip, at that time, he was knowing that they had three made, but only one was finished as a piece. And so they knew they have still spare parts, which they made, but they never assembled these watches. So all suddenly, this watch was all finished and it was offered to my father for a very reasonable price. And this was another so-called gift from Patek to our museum which really makes it very special because the third piece has been afterwards also finished about 10 years later and has been sold through auction. And I don't remember the price, but it was definitely a lot more than what we had to pay. <laughs> That's what at you that like time. to see, right? You know, for me, these are figures. And if for any reason this museum would be all gone, destroyed by fire or water, what should I do with the money? all the emotions, all the love I have with the pieces. You can never compensate me with uh, money for what we have here. So we have a responsibility and I know that you have many collectors and they should also think about not just profit. Profit is good, but the museum, we have pieces like this tower clock movement. We bought for 10,000 francs, we restored it for 90,000 and we would put it up for sale, it would probably bring 25,000. So it's not always thinking of making profit. It's about importance of having goods which belong to this society and to make it for future generations possible to admire it. So you don't want to buy? I was we'll taking talk, a lot. We'll, we'll talk afterwards. Okay, off yeah. camera. Huh? Yeah, we'll talk <laughs> off camera. Oh, no wait, you didn't look at it. <laughs> I think. The last Patek Philippe we have here is this piece, which is a watch you almost never see. These are so hard to find, and half the time when you do find them, there's something not quite right about them. You are so right. And, oh, you know, Cotier was inventing these mechanisms, mm -hmm. and this is the version that also still exists today with the two buttons, where you could put just the hour hand one hour before or backward, depending on what you wanted mm. to show when you were traveling. And I know that my father was at the Henry Stern Watch Agency in New York, and they were, when he was over there in 1958, I think, they were working on this mechanism. So this piece also is very special, even it has no dedication or something, but you see the red dot means you never ever sell. Another watch that I know has a connection to your father is, is this watch, which, is a Daniels pocket watch, but it's it's not just any Daniels pocket watch. So this watch, of course, George Daniels, it was another important friend of my father. He was always inviting 
his good friends to the Isle of Man. And after fondue or chocolate, my father had always to bring the cheese. He was coming up and saying, Teddy, I would still have something for you. He took out his paper, sneezing paper, and in it, it was this watch. And he just said, Teddy, this watch, I think it belongs to you. He never was speaking about the price. It was impossible to negotiate the price. So when he said, this is the watch for you, you just had that to say, it. thank you. And how can I make the money transfer to you? But mm. that was how George Daniels was. And of course, today we are very happy to be home of some of the pieces he has produced. And they're always going directly from the hands of him to my father. So that makes it even more valuable for us and the museum. And then you have some other watches here mm -hmm. that this is one non-Swiss watch. There's only one other non-Swiss watch we have on the table, and that's this watch from Langenzone. Mm -hmm. In 1994, I was invited with 13 other retailers in Germany. And I must say, this is the watch I, I like. First, non-typical long watch with black dial. And I like it because it has also luminous hands mm. and it has the zero reset. It's like a chronograph. Everything goes back to zero for the sweep second hand. And I can adjust really to the second or right. synchronize the minute hand with the sweep second hand. So this is a mechanism that I was missing in all our collection. And now we have it here. And going back to something that's very typical Swiss and kind of stands out, I think, amongst the rest of the collection, but is, is great, is this mundane Swiss railway watch. Yeah, and this one is even more special than the others that they make. And what you see now, if it gets to 59, it stops and it starts again while the minute hand has just been jumping. It's like at every railway station in Switzerland, they still have this mechanism. This is for me like inventing the smartwatch. This is really a smartwatch in its way. Of course, the railway clocks, which are in the stations, they function differently. They have radio signals. So to make it happen in a wristwatch, I don't know how they made it. I'm very proud to have this watch because it's not always what is most expensive. It is what is most creative and what is trying to make something happen, which everybody says you can't do it. You mentioned your love of transportation, and this watch ties into that as well. Well, you touch me again. This is my, it's love in a way, and now you know what happened to Breitling just last year, so I feel special in a way that I have been able to enjoy that relationship with Teddy Schneider so closely that he was giving me of the Super Constellation watch, which was made in a series of 10 pieces first for the crew of the airplane. They made also a series of 1,049 pieces exactly like that with the mentioning Super Constellation. But I have a double, double zero number out of 10. Since I took over the business, I have added about 10% of the pieces in the museum. 90% has been by my father. So. Okay. He will always remain the one that has been really having the guts and the intelligence to start this collection. But I'm proud in my modest way to continue to bring also some interest to the general public and also make this collection being one of the so-called top five museums in this yeah, world. I think that's fair to say.